This is NDTV. And you're watching Classics. If you've been keeping fingers crossed over whether John Kerry or George Bush will be the next president of the United States, my guest this week should in fact be getting sleepless nights. But you don't have much time for that when you are the ambassador of the United States of America in India. Ambassador David Mulford, welcome to Walk the Talk. Good morning. Thank you. How marvelous to see you here. You hit the ground running. You just came in February, and you've seen so much happen here. Well, that's right. Thank you very much. I, I, um, I've been working now with two different governments, making up some 40 political parties in the coalition. So I feel that um, every, government, every government in power, every major power uh, party in power, uh, has opted for a strong U.S.-India relationship, and so that represents a major national consensus. Well, 40 political parties, it's a, it's a, it looks a bit more exciting than back home in the U.S. for you. Well, I don't know. It looks pretty exciting there at the moment. Yes, that, that's what I was coming to, because, you know, we've never seen an election like that. Well, there have been elections that have been very, very close. In fact, the last election, you may remember, that Mr. Bush had fewer popular votes than Mr. Gore. Right. and still won in the Electoral College. So that was a very close result. In fact, I, I know many Indian politicians who, who are trying to figure out this Electoral College business because similar things happen here, but they happen because of coalitions, because somebody can get more votes in one province, less in the other. But tell me, is it, is it presumptuous of me to say that Ambassador Mulford does not have much to sleep, lose sleep over? Yes, I think I'm quite confident that President Bush will win. But it will be a very, very close election. And of course, it is always unpredictable in our system. There are new voters right. um, and new issues and very local issues, right. state to state. So you can never be absolutely sure. And you're getting new kinds of voters because American uh, demography is changing. That's right. No, in fact, yes. all the rest of the world has a vote literally in, what, in an American election. Well, I have a feeling the rest of the world would like a vote, but at this present time, they don't have it. But they. Yeah. They do express very well. In, in the sense that America, American demography is changing now, you have uh, people of Indian origin, Chinese origin, uh, Middle Eastern origin. Well, that's true, and the age group composition changes and so on. But they are, after all, all Americans, right? And they are deeply passionate about the election, and therefore we're expecting a very high turnout. Again, a high turnout always makes the result harder to predict. Right. But tell me, uh, one, it's a it's a very pol a very polarized election. But second, it's also an election dominated so much by the Middle East, Iraq, that somehow South Asia has become a little bit of a footnote. Uh, now, whatever happens in this election, uh, whether President Bush comes back or there's a change, do you see American policy towards India and South Asia changing in any way? I don't. Or evolving? I don't see a big change uh, because I think the U.S.-India relationship is now firmly entrenched and moving in a very positive direction. Um, I think if Mr. Kerry wins, there probably will be a period of adjustment and uncertainty as a new administration takes its place. And he will have to find some way to dig him out of, himself out of the outsourcing issue Hold. where he has sort of uh, right. made extreme statements. He's already backing off that. Right. But there'll have to be some sort of addressing of that problem. But by and large, I think the direction of the relationship is now set. You know, when we ask our leaders, that Indian leaders, that question about uh, John Kerry's statements on outsourcing, or you know, uh, they put it differently. They, they, they say, well, we politicians say, no, we say one thing in the heat of an election campaign. We do something very different when, it, when we come to power. Well, but Mr. Kerry has made very specific statements, and those will be regarded as commitments by certain rather key groups, right. and therefore there will be a lot of pressure on him. But, he has backed off already, and I think the whole issue of outsourcing has changed dramatically in the last few months from one which was first brought up in the primaries, it was politicized, it was demagogued, right. and then it began to be clear to people that outsourcing was in the interest of the United States. And the right. real problem was what to do about the poor and unfortunate people who lose their jobs. And right. therefore, the shift has been towards right. how much money to spend, how to re-educate, relocate yeah. people, and, 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 so and, and, and it's not a very... It's an un-American way to look at things if you, if you deny your own com companies the best way of doing business yeah. or improving it's profits. completely out of line with the private sector mentality and quite unacceptable. The companies find the economic logic of outsourcing really overpowering, so right. it'll go right on. It won't right, and, the, and companies are not doing it to deny jobs to fellow Americans. They're doing it to make better profits. Now that's right, and, and the number of jobs affected 
has been very, very small compared to the total number of jobs created and destroyed every month right. in the United States. So right. it, it really is a relatively small but a very passionate issue, and, and rightly so, because people are being unemployed, they are localized, and they have political influence locally, and this shows up in our system. So do you see this as a tactical error, or you see it just as a flash in the pan, uh, too clever by half, this whole move against uh, outsourcing? Well, I think, it was, I think it was introduced in the primaries in a way that was picked up by a relatively uneducated media. Then politicians all over the country again. started pounding their chests and saying, I'm going to do something about this. But of course, they soon realized that doing something about it by law was not going to be effective, and in right. fact, quite unpopular and a double-edged sword. Meanwhile, the media began to move people into its op-ed pages who were knowledgeable. They did a good job analyzing, and gradually opinion began to shift away from a knee-jerk hostility to a recognition right. of what was really happening in outsourcing. So you, you, you see this disappearing one way or the other, once, once a new admi administration comes No, I don't see it disappearing. I see it reducing, and then I see it possibly transforming if, over a period of time, the jobs that are outsourced begin to rise in terms of knowledge content. Right. Then I think it'll become, once again, a rather key issue because at the moment we're outsourcing jobs lower down the spectrum. Right. If that begins to change, and it probably will to some extent because of India's great competence and tremendous human talent resource pool, as well as other countries, it'll probably become something of an issue in the future. But it'll be a different kind of issue, I think. And it'll, it'll demand stronger education, training, and so on. I think we'll be better prepared for it. It's a bit funny. In the home of capitalism, the debate is not about competitiveness. The debate is about jobs. Well, that's only one part of it. The debate really is also about competitiveness. Right. Because people are now beginning to realize that a company that outsources is probably saving other U.S. jobs. There's also a huge insourcing business. We have a right. $57 billion surplus in our uh, services account. So we're insourcing much more than we outsource. Right. Now tell me, is there something, uh, you are watching this very carefully, when you, when you see this election campaign through the prism of the Roosevelt House in Delhi, do you see something that we don't? I don't think so. I think it's, um, I suppose what I see is the long-term consistency of the president as he has addressed what he sees, and I think which many Americans see, is the key issues for the United States right. in this generation. And I'm not sure the rest of the world sees the issues quite that way. So it's a very special difference in the United States. And I think Mr. Kerry has had more trouble finding his ground in this area because it is very clear what the ground is. And he doesn't want to appear to be like the president. So in order to differentiate himself, he's had a lot of trouble finding ground. He's done better recently. And obviously, there's a divided opinion at the moment in the United States. So would you say to that extent, President Bush has set an agenda which, which future presidents would find difficult to deviate from? Or one way or the other, they will have to come back to it? Well, I think that because the country is so evenly divided that if Mr. Kerry wins and if the Congress remains in the hands of the Republican Party, then there's not going to be a lot of room to move into totally new directions right. because there's a large body of public opinion and political power in our system which supports the present situation. Right. In fact, that's what worries uh, people a little bit here, that this is the most polarized election ever. I know they've been tight elections, but it's a very polarized election. The kind of rhetoric that's being used is the kind of rhetoric that sometimes gets used in Indian politics. Right. Uh, the left, right, uh, right, religion comes in. Uh, now, this is an amazing year, and you are here at this time, that both great democracies are going through elections. One has had a change, one may or may not have a change. And the int other interesting thing is that while we've had a change in India, there's been this great consistency on our approach towards United States. Mm. In fact, the communists in my country have more problems with Boston Consulting Group than with Christina Roca mm. or Kenneth Jester. Mm. Uh, do we see that consistency? in Washington, or is there something to worry about? No, I think what we're seeing, though, when you talk about a divided 
country <coughs> and strong passions. I think what we're seeing is not just Iraq and post 9-11 uh, differences of opinion about what we should be doing. It runs much deeper than that because we had a long, long period of democratic dominance in the United States running all the way from Franklin Roosevelt through the 1970s, 1980s till Ronald Reagan's time. And since then, there's been a swing back in a more conservative direction. So the more liberal elements in the United States, Democratic Party, but especially the Democratic Party's left or liberal wing, feels increasingly um, panicked, you could say, about losing power for a long, long period of time. And this election, they see, is a key election for them to begin to recover their position or lose it for another lengthy period. So I think that's part of the passion. I, it's not all tied up with Iraq. It's tied up with deep felt divisions. And of course, Mr. Kerry is a very, very liberal, the most liberal member of the Senate. So he represents those passions rather strongly. And the president is a fairly conservative right. person. So this division is not just about um, Iraq and terrorism and so on. It's much deeper. It runs to all areas of the